this morning. sound like you're ready to worship this morning. <laughs> couple, of, couple of quick announcements. One, happy Palm Sunday. Today is Palm Sunday, the day that we remember uh, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and people would place the palms or their jackets at, at his feet. And um, also, we have our annual business meeting coming up. It is this Wednesday. If you are a member of Rockaway Assembly of God, we request that you would be there. Um, Pastor Jim is having his retirement party, and there are tickets on sale out there. He is away this Sunday. I think he comes back tomorrow or Tuesday on a much-needed vacation. He's doing some retirement prep, and we want to give him a nice, proper send-off. Also, our Next Steps ministry, the purpose is to help people become fully devoted followers of Jesus. So if you are here and you want to grow in your faith more, uh, if you are new to the church, new to Christianity, if you're curious about getting baptized or becoming a member, um, or you just want to you know, grow in your faith a bit, we would encourage you to sign up. We're only going to take about 20 people, uh, and then we'll do, we'll do this a couple times throughout the year. But Next Steps, the sign up is on the coffee bar over there. 
I also want to thank you for those of you that have made missions pledges. Uh, next week, we'll talk about what we did this month for missions, the pledges. We'll celebrate together. I just want to let you guys, I'll give you guys a little heads up for those of you that are here and those of you watching online. We did really good for the month of March, so I just want to encourage you to keep it up. Uh, we, we really want to pick up a couple of new missionaries. I just want to remind you, we can't give money if it's not pledged. It's good to give to missions, right? But if the pledges aren't there, and so we sort of have the, the, the awesome thing that we go like over what our pledges are, but we need to know if we're going to pick up a couple of missionaries. And I know uh, for those of you that were here, heard our missionary to Morocco a couple weeks ago. Uh, we had the lanes in um, earlier in the year, just some great missionaries that we would love to pick up and help them do what God is calling them to do. So, uh, and last but not least, you may notice if you look in the back of this room, Something that was here for the last year is no longer there. So our online battle station uh, that Pastor Jake set up so we could live stream and do everything with, uh, with some excellence is now been moved downstairs. So I just wanted to say a big thank you to Pastor Jake, and he had some people help him do that. So it was... It was not an easy feat. Um, we had uh, Greg Burdos and Matt Wheelock that were here helping. Uh, and it was just a big task to get all of that moved downstairs and to get the remaining pieces, but it is gone. So it's, uh, anyway, I just wanted to say a big thank you to him. So if you see Pastor Jake, thank him for all of his hard work in doing that. Uh, I don't know anything about any of that stuff, so if it wasn't for him, we could not have done that. So are you guys ready to worship? All right, let's, let's pray. God, I just thank you so much for your presence that is here with us right now. Lord, I thank you that you desire to inhabit our praises this morning. Lord, we just open our hearts to you. God, we open our minds to you. We lay our will at your feet. We submit our will to yours. And we welcome you in this room right now. Just draw us into you, God, closer to you. Lord, help us to give you the praise that you so rightly deserve, that you are so worthy of.
praise God. We open our hearts, we open our minds to all that you have, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.
presence of the Holy Spirit this morning. Lord, I pray that it is the desire of every person that is attending this service, God, to draw closer to you, to know you more, to know your love, to know your truth, to know your salvation, God. I just pray that you would continue to rest in our hearts, God, and guide us, and that we would just follow you, God. Your way is perfect, your will is perfect for each and every one of us, and God, I just know that if we would just draw closer to you, Lord, and give you the glory, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Say thank you to Jesus this morning, church. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God. The Lord that makes the darkness tremble. There is no fear, there is no doubt with him. We cling to that this morning, God, we cling to you.
Him.
worship team, if we could just play that again, the but no voices. Just want to ask this morning that you would pour your heart out to God. I've often heard as we celebrate Palm Sunday this morning, I've often heard that and, and as we sung, it's appropriate because Jesus was our lamb that was slain. But when I read this story, I don't just think about Jesus being a lamb that was led to a slaughter, but I see it as a lion being led to a feast. And Jesus, he would come like a lion and he would feast on death forever. So for those of you that are here this morning that, that know Jesus, we don't have to worry about what's gonna happen after this life ends because we know that our God has conquered death. And if you're, if you're watching online this morning and you're like, man, how, you know, how, how do I become a Christian? Just take a moment and talk to God and just, just say, you know what, God, I confess my sin, I repent from my sin. Because that's what Jesus did. Jesus made a way between God and man. He was our, our mediator. He made a way for us where there was no way. And, and Jesus, as we celebrate Palm Sunday, wasn't just a lamb being led to a slaughter, but I want this to sink in, that he was a lion being led to a feast, that he would feast on death, that he would feast on sin, that he would take those things and he would have victory over them. And therefore you can have victory over those as well. Let's just take a moment and pour our hearts out to God. that is with us. God, I, I do pray that you were glorified in our time of praise and worship. May we live differently in light of it. May we remember that you weren't just a lamb led to a slaughter, 
God, where you were a lion led to a feast. You feast on the death of sin, of sickness. And you invite us to spend eternity with you. We praise you for that, God. We praise you this morning. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, thank you, worship team. Our children are dismissed. We've had some really good children's pastors in the history of Rockaway Assembly of God, but I just want you to know we've had none finer than Pastor Jen. She is doing a fantastic job with, with our kids and her amazing team that, uh, that she put together and that helped serve so faithfully. So it's an exciting time for the discipleship of our children at Rockaway. So um, anyway, today is our last Sunday of our March Missions Month. And uh, we've got to hear from some amazing guests. Uh, I got to share the, the first message of our series. And um, just wanted to, to encourage you, remind you, if you haven't made a faith promise, that is a promise in faith to support missions. Every penny that is given to missions goes to missions and nowhere else. Uh, we still have some faith promises in the back. If you haven't filled one out and you want to be part of what God's doing here, I would encourage you to fill one out. And we, I just want to remind you again, we can't give money that is not pledged. And we have a couple missionaries that I'm hoping we can pick up like ASAP, if not uh, very soon. Uh, one of them is going to be sharing with us this morning is a friend of mine from college uh, for my master's work. Some, most of you know that I got my master's degree in Christian apologetics from Biola University. It was the number one program in the entire world, and I loved my time doing it. Uh, along the way, I got to do, we have, they have summer residencies, and I got to spend three summers with this guy, so he's not sick of me yet. Um, but when we think missions, oftentimes we, I think we miss one of the largest and fastest growing people groups in the entire world, and that is the nons. It is the nons, it is the people that no longer identify as Christians, it is the people who are agnostic, who are atheist, uh, and, and they no longer believe in Jesus, and not just that, but they tend to be, uh, I've had plenty of discussions with, with many, and they tend to be a little hostile towards Christianity, and they tend to think very little of us, and it takes a unique person and a unique skill set to be a missionary to that people group. Because it's, you know, we, we think missions and we think of going to the, the Arab world or going to China or a place like that, and that's missions. I mean, we need to support missionaries, especially to places like that. Uh, but we have plenty, we have a very large group of nons in America that have few, if any, missionaries. And it's not just in America, it's around the world. There's a, a lot of countries that the roots of Christianity where, where whole nations used to be Christian, and now there's nary a, a Christian left in some of those countries. And it's, it's that unique work that Dean is uh, equipped to deal with, that Dean is equipped to reach. So Dean, why don't you come on up, give Dean a big round of applause this morning. So Dean does apologetics as missions. He, what he does is he reaches this group of nons, and... Um, it's not, again, as I said, it's not easy, and it's not fun, but I'm thankful you'll, you'll hear his heart this morning. Dean has a, a soft and gentle heart, and he has a sharp mind, which it, is what it takes to, to reach people like this. And, and I want you to, to understand the mental rigor and that it takes to, one, bite your tongue, because sometimes, you, you know, when people are mean to you and say things that are stupid, it's, our, it's in our nature to want to respond back. And, and in my younger years, I may have been guilty of responding back a few times, uh, but thank, thankful for people like Dean that uh, have just seen the way that he loves people that would, you know, they would consider themselves our opponents and the way he shares the gospel with them. So thank you, Dean. All right, Mom. It, you got to turn it on for it to work. That's right. Okay. Gotcha. You cannot use what is not turned on. Uh, very well. So once again, Ken, thank you for that uh, introduction. And I'll just say the same thing I said this morning. I view Ken as a older brother, a much older brother. Uh, since he's 40 and I'm 34, I can say that about him. So it's all good. And uh, it's, it's funny because uh, he was, he's worried about whether or not I tolerated him for three summers. I'm just surprised that he tolerated me for three summers. 
uh, you know, at, at Biola. But that was an uh, enriching time, a good time. It was, it's been great to just have uh, Ken as a friend, got to meet uh, in person uh, his family uh, this weekend. And so that's been um, awesome. And so my name is Dean Meadows. I'm the executive director of The Daily Apologist, uh, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. And we specifically deal in the area of social media apologetics, where we uh, provide quick, uh, sometimes pithy answers to really hard questions that young people are dealing with. And then we also provide free online training uh, for ministers, parents, leaders uh, who have a desire uh, to not allow or, or to do everything that they can to make sure that their child um, or they, they themselves uh, have a, a robust uh, faith that is able to step into the gap and answer the question, why do you believe what you believe? So that's essentially what we do. And really, that's where I want to start this morning. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of stories um, that I wish I didn't have to give you. Uh, it's not something that is like the highlight of my sermon. Uh, about four years ago, I was sitting at my desk, and I got a call from a young lady, and her name is Kaylee Clary. And you don't know Kaylee, you've never met her, but to me, she was like a little sister. And so uh, she was off at, at college, and she was uh, one, of the, one of the finest, uh, and still is, one of the finest human beings that I've ever met. And the way that our relationship worked is that she was the little sister, I was the older brother, so I was the one that did all the checkups, right, making sure that she was okay. Well, in that relationship, uh, I did the most of the calling. She rarely called me, usually she called me when uh, things were, were going bad or, or she needed some help navigating some, some stuff. So uh, she called me at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And I knew that she was at college, and I knew that uh, Kaylee didn't often call me at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So I figured it was one of two things. Either it was a spiritual issue or it was a boy issue. Uh, and being an older brother, right, that, that relationship... I was in the Marine Corps for six years, so I could handle the boy, right? See, didn't work at 8 o'clock, didn't work at 10.30. I guess I'm just going to quit that joke and just toss it away. You're allowed to laugh at that. That's okay. That's not a bad joke. It's not me. It's you. No, it's me. It's me. I promise it's me. It's me. And so what she ended up saying was, like, she said, hey, I, I'm in this class called Jesus in Film with a guy by the name of Dr. Bart Ehrman, who wrote the book. Uh, misquoting Jesus, who the story of who changed the Bible and why. And she said, I thought this was going to be a class about how Jesus has been portrayed in film over the course of the history of Hollywood, but actually what's taking place is that the guy that's teaching the class, he is really deconstructing everything that I ever thought about Jesus, about the Bible, about the New Testament, and I am not sure. about my faith. And as my jaw hit the floor, I said, okay, well, this is what I want to do. I want you to call me every day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, after class, and let's talk through what's taking place. And then it dawned on me that not every teen that goes off to college has somebody that they can just pick up the phone who's in a master's program at Biola to talk through these issues with. And then I asked the question, how is this happening? How is it that, that Kaylee's parents and Kaylee's church that she grew up in, a, a family that was and still is so dedicated to the work of the Lord, so dedicated to being there with uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, dedicated to making sure that Kaylee got as much spiritual nutrition as she could possibly get from the time that she was born to the time she went off to college, invested 18 years into de the development of this young lady. And in her first year, first semester, first class, she doubts. And here's where I have to tell you the hard truth. 
is that the vast majority of people who claim Christianity are not prepared and are not training young people to handle what's out there. And then uh, back in uh, December, this past December, I had just got done a, um, a session at this thing called the Exposure Youth Camp. And it was a session of about 230 students in one class. And it was called, What Do I Do When I Have Doubts? And I, I tell you what, I, I might just do a, a humble brag here, Ken. Y'all can edit this out later if you need to. Uh, but I crushed it. I crushed it. Uh, I played the, uh, I role played as an atheist. We had a good conversation. We deconstructed all that stuff. Crushed it. Like, when I talk about crushed, I'm like, Grand Slam crushed. Like, Boston winning the World Series crushed, Ken. It's, it's just for you. <laughs> um, and, and so then I went and sat down. I got a call from a, a mother. And that joy instantly turned to sorrow. As she told me about her child, who they had found out had been doubting for four years and was now uh, dating virtually a 23-year-old atheist that she never met, and asked, what do I do? And I don't know, and I'm probably going to get overly emotional about this, I don't know that I've ever had a more difficult conversation with a parent than that one. And part of the reason that I give you these stories is because you need to know that those stories exist, they're out there, and that they're real. And that for far too long, Christians have buried their heads in the sand thinking that just as long as we keep kids away from the world, the world won't have an impact on them. I don't think that that's the biblical model. As Frank Turk once said, it's about inoculation. It's about giving people the shot, a small dose of the problem and handling it in a confined, controlled area so that when they do leave, they're not surprised by anything. And that's where apologetics comes in, and that's essentially the lesson this morning, is that sometimes we think that apologetics is just uh, arguing with the internet atheist just to argue with the internet atheist. Or apologetics is just debating for the sake of debating. And you can't, and, and there's this me mentality amongst people who claim Christianity that um, apologetics and evangelism are completely different. I would argue with you this morning, pun intended, that apologetics and evangelism are like a hand that fits into a glove. It's not an either or, it's a both and. And I believe that I can show that to you from the very first gospel sermon that was ever preached in Acts chapter 2. And so I only have one point this morning. And, I, and I've, after re reflecting on this morning's lesson, I'm going to change that point. That apologetics helps us meet people where they are so God can change who they are. That apologetics helps us meet people where they are so God can change who they are. And if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and flip on over to Acts chapter 2. Because this is, uh, you know, a, a defining moment in the history of Christianity. And as we, uh, as many people around the world begin to celebrate the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, uh, sometimes we miss the epilogue. And for those of you who don't know, spoiler alert, he rose from the grave, right? Um, but what takes place after that, I would argue, is just as important as any other moment in the church's history. Because notice what happens in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, the apostles are together, and when the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Pentecost being a celebration in which Jews from everywhere came to Jerusalem to celebrate, to rejoice, to commune, to fellowship. And so the question is, okay, Jesus rose from the grave. How is God going to 
impact and notify the world that this thing called the church, this thing called the new covenant is now the covenant that they need to follow. It's now the covenant of God's people. And in verse 2, we find out. And in verse 2, it says, And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there was a dwelling in Jerusalem of Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound... At the sound of people speaking in tongues, at the sound of the apostles speaking in tongues, they came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Point number one with regards to this lesson. God shows up. That, that as we talk about apologetics and how it helps us uh, meet people where they are so that God can change who they are. The first thing that we need to understand that, that if we're going to do that, we need to understand that God has a knack for showing up. I mean, you look at the history of God's people from the very beginning all the way up to now, God has a knack of letting people know exactly who he is and what he's about. Even in instances where, where people aren't sure who God is and they're not sure what God's about. And so here you have a group of people who have just talked to Jesus, and Jesus said that they were going to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, how's that going to start, Jesus? What does that look like, Jesus? And Jesus says, first it starts with God showing up. And these, this group of people were amazed, and they asked the question, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? So you have these groups of Jews who are from around the world who are coming to Jerusalem to celebrate uh, Pentecost. And they hear this noise and they hear this sound and they ask the question, hey, aren't all these guys who are speaking in tongues, aren't they Galileans? Well, what's going on here? And so the, the text says they were hearing them each in his own native language. So as the apostles speak in tongues, the group hears the apostles in the language which they were familiar with. And in verse 12 it says, And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? So this miraculous event takes place. People are perplexed and they're asking the question, what in the world does this mean? And really what we're exposed to in this section are the two groups of people that you and I throughout the history of humanity, that when God's involved, there's two groups of people. People that ask, what does this mean? And people that mock. From day one, there have always been doubters about God. And even today, there are people, there's large swaths of people that doubt things like the existence of God. They doubt things like the reliability of Scripture. They doubt things like, did Jesus really uh, rise from the dead? And even as we look at Western culture, I just got done talking with a friend who's over in Britain. I asked the question, how many people would classify themselves as like every Sunday going Christians? They said in Britain, 5%. And we're trending that way. Atheism has jumped, has doubled from 2007 just to 2014, doubled. And the reason that it's doubling is because young people are now being, are the spearhead of the growing culture of atheism and skepticism and agnosticism. The number of young people, Gen Zers, who identify as atheists is double that of the general population. One third of young people who identify themselves as Christians aren't sure whether or not God actually is real. 50% of millennials, people in my age group, 
who identify as Christians say that evangelism, check this out, evangelism is a bad thing. Doubters. And, and, and we sometimes think that this, this movement of skepticism, this movement of doubt is, is just a 20th, 21st century American thing. No, they've been around since the garden. They've been around since Acts chapter 2 because in Acts chapter 2, some people are perplexed and then others peop other people begin to mock saying, they are filled with new wine. All right, so how, are, how is this, uh, what, what do we take about this experience that just happened? These people are saying that they had this religious experience. We're saying, no, it's not a religious experience thing. It's not a divine thing. It's not a miracle thing. It's they're a drunk thing. And here's something I want to tell you. Not every person that you talk to is going to believe your religious experience. I'm going to try to argue it away. Same here. They're trying to argue away what they just witnessed with their own eyes. And so who is going to step to the plate, so to speak? Who is the one that's going to stand in the gap and say, no, 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 this is not a drunk thing, this is a God thing? Because there's a big difference between a drunk thing and a God thing. And lo and behold, who is it? The one you would probably both most expect and least expect. Peter. And isn't it interesting that it's Peter? After all, I mean, if, if you're just going to start a religious movement and you're just going to try and get as many followers as you can to follow Jesus, why in the world would it be the guy who denied him three times? Wait, you want me to follow that guy? Wait, wasn't he the guy that said he didn't know who Jesus was to a little slave girl? Shows me two things about God. That when God desires to meet people where they are so that he can change who they are, he often uses the least of these. Why wasn't it John that stood there and had this sermon? Because after all, it, John was the only one there when Jesus died. Everybody else left. Isn't it funny that as Peter, in the moment of his trial, makes a beeline away from Jesus. When the opportunity comes to talk with Jesus again, he jumps out of the boat, he wades to the water, and he makes a beeline for him. And here in this moment, as he understands the fullness of forgiveness that's found in Jesus, he wants to make a beeline for these people's minds and their hearts. He wants to meet them where they are so that God can change who they are. And as apologists, that's what we do. As people who make a defense for the Christian worldview, your job and my job, if you're a Christian, your job is to meet people where they are so that God can change who they are. And notice what he says here. He says, But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known. And you give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk, as you suppose. Uh, hey, guys. It's going to be really hard for them to be drunk, because it's only the third hour of the day, which would be like 9 o'clock our time. So Peter says, that argument's not going to work, because it's only 9 o'clock in the morning, and Jews don't get drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. On Pentecost, that just doesn't happen on a religious holy day, a religious holy period. But I want you to note how Peter is now going to navigate his sermon. Peter is not going to say, follow me with this blind leap of faith, because after all, I'm Peter. That's not going to work. He's not going to say, hey, follow me and my 11 guys, because after all, we hung around with Jesus for a little bit. See, sometimes we think that faith is this blind theological leap into the abyss. And what Peter's going to show is that faith is trust in God based upon who God is and what 
God has given us as far as evidence. And you might be skeptical of that, but I invite you into the rest of the sermon. And so this is what he does. First thing that he does to meet people where they are so that God can change who they are is he appeals to fulfilled prophecy. He says, these people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Every Jew that was there understood who Joel was, what Joel did, and the significance of Joel's prophecy in relationship to the Messiah. That what would happen when the Messiah would, was to come. And notice it says in verse 17, directly from Joel, Joel 2, and in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And so while there are, God shows up and there are doubters, Peter now begins to make his passionate plea. And your old men shall dream dreams. And even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on my name on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's not the first thing he appeals to. He also appeals to David. In verse 25, For David said concerning him, Jesus, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let the Holy One, your Holy One, see corruption. You have made it known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. And we'll come back to that in a second. But notice the first thing that, that uh, Peter does to meet people where they are, to meet these Jews where they are, is that he, he appeals to fulfilled prophecy. They're not drunk. This is what Joel prophesied, and this is what you've just witnessed. The second thing that he appeals to is the argument from miracles on the basis of what Jesus did during his ministry. Notice in verse 22, he starts off with a prophecy from Joel, and then he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. How did he start off the first point? Hear these words. Second point, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God. With mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him, where? While you were sleeping? 50 years ago? 10 years ago? 8 weeks ago? No, in your midst. See, this Jesus guy, he's not a stranger to you. It's not like if someone went to these Jews and said, hey, what do you think of Jesus? They'd be like, who's Jesus who? No, Peter's saying, no, the guy that worked miracles and wonders in your midst. He's the one that through those miracles is attested to you by God. And, and essentially what Peter is saying is it's really hard for you to dismiss Jesus given what he's done in your midst. And even the apostles talk about this in, in John 1. John talks about how the things that he has seen, the things that he has heard, the things that he has touched. And, and Peter says when he writes in, in, in his letter, he talks about how that these are not uh, cleverly devised myths, but they were eyewitnesses to the majesty of Jesus through God. And he goes, we've seen it, and so have you. So he argues from fulfilled prophecy. He argues from the signs and wonders. And notice what he says, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You, uh-oh, You crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men. Whoops. 
And that's the third point that Peter makes. He appeals to prophecy. He appeals, uh, he, he appeals to the miracles of Jesus. And then finally, he appeals to the argument from the resurrection. And go back down to verse 29 as he talks about David and this relationship. He, he draws this comparison between David and Jesus. And he says, brothers, I may say to you with confidence that the patriarch David, that he both what died and was buried and his tomb is with us today. Basically, Peter's saying, uh, you guys want to go see David? Everybody knows where his tomb is. And you go see his bones. And David, he's a well-respected Jew right there, uh, right there alongside of Moses. But, but he says, I want to tell you something. There's a really big difference between David and Jesus. In that David, you can go to his grave and you can find his bones and you can say, here lies King David. Can't do that with Jesus. Isn't it funny that when you look at the end of Matthew... As the Roman guards are talking to the religious elite, the argument isn't over whether or not the tomb is empty. They both agree the tomb's empty. The argument is, how are we going to get you out of this so that you don't get in trouble? Oh, well, we'll, give you, we'll, we'll tell them that while you were asleep, the disciples came and, and stole the body. Well, that doesn't work because you don't know what happens when you go to sleep. So even the excuse doesn't work. And Peter's drawing the comparison that whereas David's tomb is full of bones, Jesus' tomb is full of nothing. And he says, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up And of that, we are all witnesses. You've seen his signs and wonders, but we are all witnesses of his resurrection. How can you deny the prophecy? How can you deny the miracles? And how can you deny the empty tomb? That's Peter's plea. That's Peter making a defense for why they should accept Jesus as the Messiah. Verse 33, being therefore exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. So he ties it all together. He says, the reason that you're seeing this is because Joel prophesied about it. Jesus was attested to by miracles and that this is what was going to follow upon his resurrection. And then comes the spiritual nail to the heart. Because now that Peter has laid the groundwork, now that Peter has, uh, you know, revealed the evidence for who Jesus is and what he's done and why this is all going on on Pentecost, he always is going to bring it back to the individuals that he's talking to. And it's not going to be an easy message. It's not going to be, let's hold hands and sing kumbaya. It's not going to be dreidel, 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 I made it out of clay. He's going to reiterate something that is going to be absolutely devastating. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you have crucified. Wait, say that one more time, Peter, for all the Jews in the back. You have crucified him. The, Peter is saying the same people that are hearing my voice, the same people that are hearing this impassioned plea, the same people that are hearing this evidence that I'm laying out for Jesus, they're the same ones who cried out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. They're the same ones that when it came time to choose between Jesus or Barabbas, they chose Barabbas 
over Jesus. They're the same ones who, in, whose leaders stood before Jesus and said, well, if you're the Elijah to come, bring yourself off the cross. And now, it sinks in that they have made a grave mistake. And we ask the question often, how could they miss it? But maybe we need to ask the question, how could we? Because in the sin that I struggle with, in the sin that I partake in, in the sin that dominates me, in the sin that weighs me down, I too am also rejecting the Savior, the Messiah, the Lion, the Lamb. And so this morning, I want to ask a very serious question that's, that's not related to a nonprofit, that's not related to Yankees, Red Sox, but it's related to you. What's weighing you down and keeping you from a deeper relationship with God? For them, it was the fact that they thought Jesus was a heretic. They had a different conception of the Messiah. They thought the Messiah was a physical thing, not a spiritual thing. They had blinders on. What are your blinders this morning? But what's so refreshing about Acts chapter 2 is not just the sermon that Peter lays out, and it's, and it's not just, I mean, if Acts chapter 2 just ends right here, we could say that, man, it was a great sermon and that a bunch of people were really sad about their sin. And that would be heartbreaking because they're not being given a way out. But Peter provides that way out because they say that they were cut to the heart when they heard this. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? How do I get out of this predicament? How do I get out of the fact that I have to now deal with the guilt and the shame and the weight of knowing that I was in the crowd and I told the Savior that they should crucify him, that I was there and I told them that, hey, you need to release the murderer, Barabbas, instead of this guy who is absolutely positively sinless. How do you get out of that situation? And this morning, you may not be a Christian. You might be asking yourself, how do I get out of this situation? You may be contemplating Christianity. You might say, how do I get out of this situation? We're going to get out of my sin predicament. And Peter looks directly at the crowd, and he said to them in verse 38, Peter says to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And watch this. And you will receive, you'll receive something. You'll receive not only the remission of your sins, but you'll also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise. Well, who's this promise for? Well, the Jewish ideology was, well, only Jews can find God. Only Jews are God's chosen people. Only Jews can really have an intimate relationship with Jesus. And not just any Jew, but pure Jews. You want to know why Jesus got some flack for hanging around a woman from Samaria? Not just because she was a woman, but because she was a half-blood. Because the Samaritans weren't pure Jews. But notice what Peter says. In the New Covenant, in the New Covenant, it's not about what family you grew up in. In the New Covenant, it's not about who you are but whose you are. And the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off to whom the Lord God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness. So with many other words, he kept presenting evidence. He kept talking about Jesus. He kept talking about how these people needed to be saved. And he continued to exhort them, save yourself from this crooked and corrupt generation. If there's a message that needs to be uh, preached loud and clear in 21st century Western culture, it's that. But I can't preach that unless I know how to meet people where they are. So that God can change who they are. And that's exactly what making a defense for the Christian worldview does. And notice the result. And so those who received his word were baptized, 
And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Don't tell me that a mass number of people can't be converted in a single day. If it can happen in Acts chapter 2, it can happen in 2021. But here's the question, or questions as I wrap up. For you, when was the last time you asked the question, why do I believe what I believe? When was the last time you had a conversation with your kid about that? And if you haven't done either of those, why not? Because it's going to take people who have responded to God in the same way that these people responded to Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. To do and take and get the necessary tools in their tool belt to impact the culture. And I would argue with you this morning, pun intended, that if we're not people who, one, haven't seriously asked the questions about why we believe what we believe, we will never be prepared to tell our children why they should believe what they believe. Far too many parents have given the responsibility of raising their kids over to the lead preacher of their congregation, to their youth minister, and they haven't invested enough time in their own kids. And far too many students, because they have lacked the training, go off to college, take a New Testament studies class, are shaken to their core, and they come back and they got no answers. God is not a God of mystery. Our God is a God of answers. And so this morning, two things. If you're not a Christian, Peter invites you in the same way that he invited those Jews to come to a knowledge of the truth. And then if you're a parent, if you're a Christian, What's keeping you from getting the necessary training for you to help yourself and your kid? Because odds are, if you have a Gen Z in your home, odds are right now that by the time they leave high school, they'll disconnect from church, and by the time they leave college, they won't ever go back. And I'll share something with you that I didn't share in the early session. When I started my master's degree, never knew I was going to run into Ken, but it's a blessing. But I started it for me. I started it because I wanted to know why I believed what I believed. And then God does some strange things in life. He blessed me with two young girls, Nora Grace and Ren Mercy. And as soon as I held Nora Grace in my hands for the first time, my mission in apologetics completely and totally changed. It was no longer just about me. And you know what? Here's the hard truth. They may grow up and they may completely walk away from Christianity. That's a possibility. But they will not walk away because their dad does not have an answer. They will walk away because they have rejected the objective truth of Christianity. And if I'm going to pick a way in which my kid's going to leave the church, I would rather it be they don't leave. But if they happen to, I would rather it be because they just simply don't want the truth, they've rejected the truth, and they don't want a relationship with God, rather than they come to me and say, I walked away because mom, dad, preacher, leadership never gave me any answers. Apologetics helps us meet people where they are, like Peter did, so that God can change who they are. One, are we willing, if you're not a Christian this morning, are we willing to look at the evidence and then follow the evidence where it leads, which I believe is to Acts chapter 238, 
But then if we are a Christian, are we willing to take the time to invest ourselves in the tools and the resources that can help us save souls of our kids and of skeptics? I promise last thing. Too often we think that apologetics and evangelism is the role of the guy that stands up here every Sunday. It's not. And if you think that it is, you have not read the book of Acts. So my encouragement to you this morning is, one, if you're not a Christian, become one. If you're skeptical about Christianity, I would love to talk to you. And number three, if you are a Christian, invest in apologetics personally for yourself and for the soul of your children. Let's dwell on that this morning uh, as we conclude. Thank you, Dean. Man, I don't know about you, but I know I was certainly challenged and uh, loved what Dean had to share. Uh, maybe biased, uh, maybe a classmate of his. I'll take it. Um, but yeah, so anyway, I just want to do two things. I know some of you have to get your kids, but these are the two things I'm going to ask. There's a white offering bucket at the back. Uh, Dean lives off of the support of uh, people and churches like ours. If you want to make a donation to his ministry, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, and uh, yeah, then he has a ton of resources online. If you want to check out, it would be a great way to dive in a little bit. There's a free course for uh, anyone looking to, to grow a little bit. And also, one of our core values as a church is that only God makes sense of life. So if you're looking for a little more, don't remember that message, or you just missed it, I would encourage you to go back, check it out. It was in October. It uh, covers uh, some similar things and you know, lays, lays some groundwork there. Uh, the last thing I'd like to do is ask you to extend a hand. I just want to pray for Dean. One of the things I shared in, in my message about how only God makes sense of life is good apologetics does three things. It, it equips believers, which Dean shared this morning, and I hope that you're feeling a little bit more equipped and a little bit more a desire to be equipped. It evangelizes unbelievers, which he also works in that realm with uh, internet atheists, um, and also he's done, done debates, had people on his, his show or his podcast, um, and then it helps shape culture, which we desperately need to shape culture, especially for our young people. So just stretch out a hand. Let's pray for Dean. Lord, I just thank you for Dean, God. Lord, I just ask your blessings and your abundance on his life. Lord, I ask that you would continue to anoint him and empower him to do this work, God, to, Lord, to build your church, God, to strengthen the church, and, Lord, to reach people that literally no one else is reaching, God, that so few people are involved in reaching this group, God. And it's a growing group, Lord. It's a group that's growing even in America. Uh, God, I just ask that you would give Dean the tools and the, the connections, the opportunities, the provision. Uh, God, that he would be able to do this many times over, God, that he would be able to continue to speak in different churches, that he'd be able to continue to grow what he does on the internet. And Lord, that, that many people would be in eternity because of this vital ministry that he's part of, God. I ask your protection and your blessings on his family and his children, God. Lord, and I, again, I just ask for your provision for his every need and your continued empowering in his life. We thank you for Dean, God, for the blessing he was to our congregation. In your mighty name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen. God bless you, church. If I could pray for you, I'd love to pray for you. If you want to chat with Dean, he'll be out in the lobby there. Enjoy the rest of your day.